The member for Ryan has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to speak on the Appropriation Ryan. Bill No. 1 and 2, 2017-18, and the Appropriation Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 1, 2017-18. This is an important budget, a budget that is about making the right choices to provide opportunity and secure better days ahead for all Australians. Hey, hey. I note with pride the Turnbull government's commitment to defence. And as part of Appropriation Bill No. 1, the Department of Defence will receive more than $32 billion to keep our nation safe. Last Wednesday, I joined the Minister for Defence Industry at Gallipoli Barracks in my electorate to launch the new generation of trucks and trailers as part of the government's $3.5 billion Land 121 project. I can assure members here today that through the strategic procurement of new military equipment, like the next generation of trucks I witnessed last week, and importantly, many components sourced from local Australian businesses, the Coalition is ensuring the best products for our defence personnel, as well as supporting local jobs and growth. Mm -hmm. Australian servicemen and women can be assured that the Coalition is acting in their best interests. Right. This year's budget represents a significant increase in funding of $350 million for the support of veterans and demonstrates our commitment to the men and women who ensure Australia's freedom and safety. Importantly, the government is focused on responding to the mental health needs of our former defence personnel and providing support that will help them to achieve a positive life outside of service. Last year's budget saw the Coalition provide treatment for depression, PTSD, anxiety and drug and alcohol misuse free for anyone who had served even a day in the full-time ADF. The $33.5 million expansion of the non-liability health care program to cover all mental health conditions announced in the 2017 budget recognises that the earlier a veteran receives treatment, the better their health. Funding for mental health treatment is demand-driven and not capped. If an eligible person requires treatment, it will be provided. As a government and on a personal level, we understand that families of service members also bear the brunt of military service. In recognition of this, the budget provides $8.5 million to expand eligibility for veterans and veterans' families counselling service. The health portfolio will receive more than $11 billion to ensure the essential services that Australians deserve. $3 billion of this funding will be used for the Home Support and Care Program to provide assistance for older Australians so that they can remain in their home and stay connected with their community. The 2017 budget is delivering for healthy health and supports our long-term national health plan, based on the four pillars of guaranteeing Medicare and the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, supporting hospitals, prioritising mental and preventative health and investment in medical research. The Coalition has a solid track record when it comes to improving Australians' access to medicines with a strengthened pharmaceutical benefits scheme. We are immediately delivering on this commitment in the 2017 budget with more than half a billion dollars to list special medications for patients with chronic heart failure. This will benefit more than 60,000 Australians every year who currently pay around $2,000 a year for these medicines. Our careful management of the PBS spending means that we're able to list new, effective medicines on the PBS when they become available. Australia's PBS is one of the foundations of our universal health care system, the envy of the world. The Department of Social Services will receive $5 billion. This money includes more than $800 million per year for the provision of demand-driven disability employment services and $225 million for other disability and carer services. In my capacity as Assistant Minister for Disability Services, I see firsthand how the Coalition Government's Disability Employment Services policy is creating more opportunities. Members here will be well aware that Australians with disability are underrepresented in our workforce. More than 14% of people who are of working age have a disability, but only 53% of people with disability are working or seeking work, compared with 83% of people without disability. This is one of the lowest rates in the OECD for workforce participation of people with disability. 
and we must do better. That Australia ranks 21 out of 29 OECD countries is not acceptable, and as I often say, if it was a sport, it would be on the front page of our papers and held up as a national disgrace. But for people with disability to be employed at the same rate as people without disability, 640,000 more people with disability need employment. Our challenge is to bridge the gap to help more people with disability find and keep jobs and to encourage more employers to employ more people with disability. Employment offers a person economic security and independence and contributes significantly to their positive well-being. For a person with a disability, often their job is more than just a job. It links them to the community and exposes them to new experiences. In government and in the community and among business and industry, we need to do all we can to recognise the benefits of employing people with disability. On budget night, the Coalition confirmed our commitment to improving employment outcomes for people with disability and announced improvements to the Disability Employment Services Program. I have spoken with many stakeholders since budget night and they tell me the changes have been well received. There will clearly be some qualitative differences on certain budget measures, but, simply put, Australians do not want government to spend more than Australian taxpayers can afford. We all have a moral responsibility to restrain spending, boost investment, encourage economic growth and guarantee a strong social safety net. Labor's magic pudding economics that underwrote year-on-year -year promises of a non-existent budget surplus resulted in increasing deficits and leaving disappointed Australians genuinely concerned about our economic future. When was the last time a Labor government delivered a budget surplus? 1989. In 1989, completely correct, Minister, 27 years ago, when the member for Bendigo and the member for Hotham were just nine years old. Joel was in short pants. Much of this has changed in this time, including the return to a surplus during the Howard government years. This was only to be destroyed by the Rudd government's economic mismanagement debacle and his school of the magic pudding ministers, many of whom still sit opposite today. The critical importance of adequately funding the National Disability Insurance Scheme is especially important to me. This vital aspect was addressed in the 2017 budget by way of the 0.5 per cent increase in the Medicare levy from 1 July 2019 to once and for all ensure that Labor's NDIS funding black hole is filled. That the NDIS was properly funded when Labor left office is simply not true. Savings that Labor claimed were to be directed to the NDIS were simply returned to consolidated revenue and spent several times over. They were never set aside for NDIS. But, unlike Labor, the Coalition actually has the plan to implement fiscal policy that will ensure a fully funded NDIS, not just for the short term, but for future generations. Mr Deputy Speaker, I segue to small business, the engine room of our economy. Here, here. The 2017 budget gives small businesses right across Australia the confidence that the Coalition government is acting in their best interests. Absolutely. The Ryan electorate is home to more than 13,000 small businesses, from sole proprietors to larger entities. Small businesses are responsible for 36 per cent of all economic output in Australia and employ more than 4.7 million Australians, which amounts to 45 per cent of all employment in Australia. Travelling around my local community, I constantly hear about the support small businesses have for the positive impacts this year's budget will have for them. Most notably, small businesses and their supporters are reassured by our measures to increase the small business turnover threshold from $2 million to $10 million to allow more small businesses to access small business tax concessions and reduce red tape. The 2017 federal budget continues the government's plan to back hard-working small businesses to create more local jobs and pursue new investment. This means a well-received lower small business company tax rate of 27.5 per cent and simplified depreciation rules, including immediate tax deductibility of assets worth up to $20,000. We know that small businesses are a big deal. 
and any avenue we as a government can provide to help them grow further acknowledges their contribution to the Australian economy. Businesses like Kenmore Plaza Seafoods, known by families in the area as the place of Charlie's Chips, Kenmore Plaza Seafoods is thriving, so much so that the owners of family business improved their eating dining options. Bricky Espresso and Gelato Bar, located on Hawken Drive in St Lucia, typifies the success that local small businesses have achieved through measures of the coalition government. Sav and his family have expanded their business to become the favourite Greek institution known throughout Brisbane. Mr Deputy Speaker, these are the types of businesses that are the lifeblood of Australia's economy right. and provide employment for young and old, and importantly, those with disability. And I must not forget the quintessential local hardware store, Doyle's Home Timberware and Hardware, Blackwood Street, Mitchelton. This family-owned business services tradespeople and DIYs alike, but still remains old-fashioned and familiar. With staff employed from the local area, this well-equipped and experienced business is another Ryan business that typifies the positive outcomes of hard work. As a government, we are doing everything in our power to give them a big future. That's right. We are a government of results, mm -hmm. and the beneficial results that the coalition has achieved speak for themselves. Ben Carson, a famous neurosurgeon and current Republican politician, once said that economics is not brain surgery. So I ask, why is it that Labor continually underperforms and, worse, criticises the coalition for taking the necessary steps to create a secure platform for economic growth. The Australian public is tired of Bill Shorten's relentless negativity. It is tired of the politicking of the Labor Party, which is trying to stop investment in this country, investment that will support more growth for better paid jobs and more jobs for Australians. That's right. Mr Deputy Speaker, while I recognise the Labor leader wants to run the government like a union, Australians do not want their government to spend their money like a union boss with a union credit card. More debt is not the measure by which I want future generations of Australians to judge us. This parliament must work. For government, money to make things happen can only come from three places – increased taxes, increased borrowings or savings. Mr Deputy Speaker, only the coalition government takes their financial responsibilities for the NDIS seriously. We understand the necessity to ensure we live within our means support Australian families, make Australia safe and encourage economic growth. But unlike Labor, only the Coalition has a plan to secure better and more jobs and better pay. That's right. Only the Coalition has a plan to guarantee essential services like Medicare and the NDIS and ensure Australian families can raise their children in a safe environment with food on the table. Those opposite simply do not have a plan. I commend these bills to the House. Here, here. Thank the member.